My name is Diana. I'm going to be talking about some skills that can help you regulate and kind of, you know, go over some basics. So the first couple of things that I will talk about is kind of different ways that um, you can utilize breathing to help you regulate your system. So like in a situation like this where everything was working right up until I needed to speak, um, you might feel super anxious, activated, heart racing. And one of the things that you can do, it's called box breathing. And basically it's inhaling for four, holding for four, exhaling for four, and holding for four. And you can kind of do this a couple of times. The key is that it's a box, you know, even holds, even exhale and even inhale. Now, another way that, that you could do this is basically it's called a four, seven, eight breath. And the, the key here is to have your exhale be twice as long as your inhale. So if you're gonna inhale for four, you're gonna hold your breath for seven, and then you're gonna exhale for eight. And does that make sense to everybody? And though if you do that a few times, that can help you sort of ground yourself, feel a little bit less stressed because a lot of times when we're angry, we're nervous, we start breathing really shallow, which tells our brains and our bodies that like, okay, like something bad is happening and we get even more worried, nervous. And so the physical kind of is following the breath, okay? Um, the other type of breathing that I really like to use when I, when I work with people, it's called belly breathing. Um, essentially, it is a focus on breathing through your diaphragm and paying attention to that versus like, you know, like with your chest. And I'm gonna actually kind of show it because it makes more sense that way, but it's, you're gonna put one hand on the top of your belly, one hand on your chest. The chest is sort of optional. It's mainly to make sure that it's stabilized. Um, and you take a deep, slow breath in through your nose and you're gonna like go through your mouth and your feet. You're basically focusing on like your bottom hand, the hand on your belly moving and making sure that the hand that's on your chest is staying still. And you can do that a few times. Now, if you wanna be laying down, you can do that and having your, your knees bent and your feet flat, or if you're sitting up, making sure you have your feet flat on the floor and you're kind of in kind of a straight posture as you can. The important thing is, is to make sure that you're breathing through your diaphragm and not like like this, more like, you know, like your, your bottom hand, the one on your belly is moving. Um, there's not really like a set amount of time or you're not timing your breaths. It's more of just focusing on that breathing. Um, the other way that you could do this is basically inhaling for as long as you can, you're holding your breath for as long as you can, and you're exhaling for as long as you can, okay? Um, the thing that I like about using your breath is that it can help you to regulate yourself and help you sort of focus. And if you feel overwhelmed and like, everything is too much, it can help you come back down. The other thing that it can help you do is if you're in a situation where somebody else is very maybe angry, upset, nervous, you don't have to say anything, you don't have to do anything, but as you start to breathe sort of calmly and slowly and deeply, the, the other person will also, most of the time, follow those breaths and start to sync up and will also be able to calm down. And that's really good in a situation where things have, you know, maybe escalated, somebody's really stressed and you can't just tell them to calm down because, you know, like that never really works well. Um, but if you are breathing kind of, and you're mindful of your own breath, it usually helps the people around you to also be able to focus on the present moment. And the other skill that I wanted to talk about um, is basically naming what is happening. And it sounds easy. And, and you know, when, when I'm calm and everything's fine, it is. But when you're not, it, it can be a little bit harder. But essentially, let's say that like you got into an argument with someone 
and you know you have all of these interesting thoughts you are just like ready to yell at them tell them you know to go wherever before you do any of that the one thing that you do is actually like name the thing that's happening like name the thing that you're feeling oh man like i'm really angry right now and it doesn't sound like it would do much or it would make a huge difference but it does because it does help your brain ultimately understand what's happening and it tells your brain and your body that you're paying attention to what's happening so it doesn't need to pull your attention away more and it could be i'm lonely i'm angry i'm upset i'm anxious i'm stressed right and you don't have to do anything other than that however there is a part two if you're up for it if you can if you feel like it's kind of useful for you is sort of also paying attention to the sensations in your body. And so what I mean by that is, okay, I'm angry, what am I sensing? Oh, my jaw is clenched. My heart is racing. Oh, like my muscles are tense, right? Or, oh, I'm so nervous and, and or maybe I'm so scared. Oh, I feel flushed, my hands are cold. My, you know, so you're naming the actual physical sensations. And so sometimes that can do kind of two things. One, if you're feeling tension, let's say your muscles are tense, your jaw is clenched, you can reverse that and do the opposite. Relax your muscles, unclench your jaw, right? Helps you feel less of that emotion and less of that feeling that maybe right now isn't useful for you. The other thing that it can do is give you hints about what's going on before for the emotion, the feeling, the experience becomes too big. Like, oh, you know what? Like, I'm getting a little bit upset. Like, uh, ooh, like I can feel it in my body. So you can take steps to kind of not explode and, and yell at people and react. You can take yourself out of that situation. And I find that that really helps because then you're, you are paying attention to your body, to yourself, to how you're feeling. Um, Another way that you can also kind of use this is when you are saying like, oh, I am angry. If you would like to maybe even create a little bit more distance or maybe you not feel like it's so overwhelming is you could look at it as like a part of me is really angry, right? Like a part of me is really upset. And that helps your brain sort of categorize it so it doesn't overwhelm your entire system, your entire nervous system. Um, and those are the kind of the, the, the techniques that I, I'm going to talk about at the end, we'll, we'll have some time for questions. Um, I will also have this in a PDF form because I didn't have slides. I'm sorry. Um, if anybody wants it written down. So if you didn't catch any of that, you will have that. Okay. Thank you, Diana. Richard. Hi everybody. Um, my name is Richard. Um, I'm a social worker here in Illinois. And today I'll be talking about the mindfulness skill. Uh, mindfulness is something that is a bit of a buzzword. You might have heard about it from your EAP at work or like news about the cry boxes and the Amazon warehouses. Um, but it's a powerful tool that doesn't need to be lumped together with um, some of those more negative connotations. So my, mindfulness comes from a application of a Buddhist thing. I, I don't remember what the words are. Zen Buddhism has a whole different word for it, but it's a practice of fostering awareness. Um, and if you think about modern society and the, the capitalist country we live in, we are constantly being prompted by alerts on our phone, by advertisements, by the fear of layoffs, by the fear of like, do you have enough money? So like, we're, it's constantly trying to keep you out of the present moment and elsewhere. Mindfulness is the process of getting back into the present moment. So if everyone's okay with trying this, um, a quick mindfulness exercise that we can do is just to begin fostering our awareness of the present moment. And that includes everything that goes along with it. 
So I'll just kind of start with myself. And the first thing I'm noticing, so kind of going off of what Diane was uh, talking about with noticing my emotional state, I'm feeling a bit anxious. I'm feeling the tightness in my chest. I'm feeling a little bit of the tightness in my throat. My mind's wandering a little bit. I'm thinking about the sounds I'm hearing through the door. My son's out there playing. I'm thinking about my work from earlier today. I'm thinking about what I'm going to do after this. And in this process, what I'm trying to do is avoid connecting with any of those thoughts or experiences too deeply. Because if I start thinking about my 11 a.m. client tomorrow, I'm not gonna be here and I won't be able to deliver this message to you. I won't be able to answer your questions later. And I also, like, aside from thinking about like this activity, in any activity, I won't be able to participate fully. And if it's a pleasurable thing, enjoy it. And if, honestly, even a displeasurable thing, there is some value to the experience of it. Mindfulness can be really any sort of activity that you're going to pay attention to. Mindfulness meditation is a more extreme way of practicing this, and it, it can be very useful, especially if you found yourself often in a pattern of getting lost in thoughts or doing things that are not here in the present. Um, basically, with that process, you're just going to sit with low stimulation, and when, when you have a thought, kind of acknowledge it. When you have an experience, acknowledge it. But then you return your attention and focus to a simple activity. So oftentimes that's breathing. So you can, you can combine that with um, one of the breathing exercises that Diane mentioned. Um, especially if you're feeling anxious, you can combine it with box breathing. If you're not feeling any sort of way, you might just do the belly breathing and notice how the air feels in different ways throughout your body. Kind of your stomach being pushed out, going back in, air coming in through your nose, feeling dry, coming out your mouth. Um, but that's going to be the focal point. So every time you get distracted by, did I pay the phone bill? Can I pay the phone bill? You return your attention back to that thing that you're paying attention to. Meditation doesn't have to be a super long thing. A lot of times we think about it in terms of monks who are sitting uh, on a pillow somewhere for a couple hours. It can be as simple as when you're brushing your teeth for those two minutes, paying attention to the, the brush strokes, really experiencing that process. And as your mind wanders, returning it back to the present moment. Um, and I think with that, I don't want to get too much further into mindfulness. If you're interested, um, there are lots of resources, some of them good, some of them bad, just as with anything else. Uh, but I encourage you to ask questions later and to research it further if it's of interest. Okay, thank you, Richard. Thank you, Diana. We, we're going to open the floor for uh, comments and questions for, from the audience. I want to remind everyone that um, our objective is to accumulate skills that will help us uh, to be in the collective work setting, our collectives, uh, productively. Um, so um, even if we get angry, how do we manage ourselves? Even if we get disappointed, how do we manage ourselves? Um, even if um, the news is so challenging that um, we're feeling whatever it is we're feeling, how do we help ourselves? Um, and actually the point is capitalism is becoming more and more oppressive. So how do we cultivate those skills that will help us be able to continue in this collective work project to change capitalism. So the floor is open for comments and questions. Mushin, your mic is open on our end. 
Thank you very much for letting me speak. As, as you well know, that the, the system is getting more oppressive and it is demanding more of our time, our attention from, from things that we want to do. We want to, if you have a movement that you have an additional demand on you, you, you keep you away from doing things you should be doing as a party, party member and all of that. And then they have to do the personal life. There is, there is a, you have so much time in the daytime, 24 hours, you have to spend time with your family. That takes your time from your movement. How do you have sort of deal with this problem? This is, this is something that I see a lot of people start with the I do just with myself. So I just wonder if you have any ideas how to deal with this sort of stuff. Thank you. Okay, I think Musin was asking about time. How do you balance the challenges in this capitalist society? How do you balance the challenge of family, movement, work? Uh, so let's take, thank you, Musin. So let's take uh, a couple of more. Uh, well, actually, go on each. Diana and, and uh, Richard, you can each respond. I think the challenge is recognizing that you may not have time for everything every day, all the time. And recognizing that sometimes you don't even have, you know, like your your mediocre to give to things and and understanding that maybe today is a day that work you're not giving all of your energy to because you have family things because you don't feel well because something happened and sometimes maybe you will be forced to give more time and energy to work because you have to you know survive in the society for right now and the way i look at it is you do not need to be perfect it doesn't have to always look a certain way it doesn't you can understand that like this is hard and be kinder to yourself which will allow you to be kinder to everybody else around you that's important richard i really don't have much to add there very well said diana um and i i frequently don't strike the right balance but the, each day is a new day to try it Antonio, your mic is open. Hi, D. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Thanks, folks, for the uh, presentation. I was wondering uh, if you all um, also implement or, or include um, proper diet and a strenuous exercise program, because I find that helpful um for in my in myself you know keeping my equilibrium especially the exercise program because i i i find that i i get frustrated after after some time and i need a uh, a way to uh release that negative energy and bring me back to you know a a a middle ground where you know i could try to um, create um, a, a, a unification of, of, you know, of, of extremes. Thank you, Antonio. Um, let's take a few more. Thank you, Antonio. Okay, Carol. Actually, this is Kazu uh, we're, okay. we're with Carol. Mm -hmm. My question is, there are people in the movement uh who would like to talk to somebody who understands why being in the movement might be hard for us or is there are there uh therapists or types of therapists that we can go to um that a regular therapist may not understand what we're talking about but somebody in the movement would and this is not only from me, but I've talked to a couple of other people that are having problems because when they go to a, re a so-called regular therapist, the therapist doesn't understand why we might get so upset or be so nervous. So uh, my quest that's my question. Thank you, Kazu. Thank you. 
Uh, so we have two questions now. Please keep your hand, the rest of you keep your hands up. Uh, but uh, Diana and, and Richard, let's respond to those two questions. So for the first guess, um, I definitely talk about diet and exercise and I tend to frame it in kind of similarly to how you answered the previous question of making sure that as long as it's working for you and it, it makes you feel good and you're paying attention to like the positive side of how it's helping you versus using it as a punishment. Um, and that's kind of how I frame it. And for the second question, it is really hard to find a, a therapist. Um, my, the, so there are certain things that you can ask a potential therapist um to see whether they will understand you or not and again there's not i don't i don't think there's like a list of people that you can go through you know but you can definitely ask them things that that will clue you in as to whether or not their values their lens of the world aligns with yours whether they will be able to understand you um so asking them their political views their their views on what's happening in the world or you know, like things like that. And a lot of times therapists will offer a consultation, like a, a 15 minute conversation. And you can kind of, the things that you're, you're worried about and wondering about, you should be able to ask them. And if they, you know, react badly or seem uncomfortable with some questions, perhaps that will give you the information that maybe this is not the person for you. Um, that's honestly the, the kind of the best answer that I have for for that question. Richard, do you want to add anything? Sure. Um, so to um, the, the point on exercise, that, that's a very useful thing to do if you're able to. Um, some of the greatest revolutionaries were big into fitness. Lennon was a wrestler. Uh, Mao was a swimmer. Kim Il-sung made sure that physical education was a priority in um, the DPRK, and we found we have science proving that exercise is a great way to get rid of cortisol. Um, something I like to talk to my clients about is that evolutionarily we're not meant to live in the society that we live in. So we're constantly producing stress hormones that are physical responses, preparing us for physical altercation for all sorts of different things. And unless you have a way of getting rid of specifically cortisol, it can feel like anxiety. If you already have anxiety, it can make things worse, lead to all sorts of problems. Um, but you have to do what you can do. There are other ways to release cortisol. Breathing exercises is another great way. So it's, it's what you're, you're able to do and what fits your lifestyle. Um, and then in terms of finding left therapists, um, I, I know there are some websites like Reddit has a group for left-wing therapists. I don't know how easy it is to find somebody in your locale who can do it. And then it becomes more difficult because our, our licensing is based on the state that we reside in. So if, if you might find someone online, there's a pretty good chance they won't be able to work with you. I would maybe encourage connecting with other people in your party, um, maybe another organization nearby. If you have a DSA, you know, there are other places just to, to see where people are going and if maybe there are therapists in the movement that are accepting people, accepting new clients rather. All right, so we're looking for more raised hands, more raised hands. Matt, your mic is open on our, there you are. Hello, hi. Um, do you have any suggestions for those of us who are really rural in rural America, or um, do you have any? Um, are there any historical movements that might speak to the restrictions of being so rural? Thank you, Matt. Let's see if we have any other um, comments or questions. Okay, Laura, your mic is open. There you are. Yeah. Would you talk about multitasking? Um, I find myself addicted to it, but I think it's stressful too. So I'd like you to address that. Okay. Um, 
I'm going to share something I've been debating as to whether or not I would, but I think I will. Um, I, uh, we need to thank uh, Diana and Richard because it was at the last minute that we were able to um, pull them in to help us with this uh, session tonight. Uh, we had a uh, plan to have another person and I believe they uh, are having trouble, uh, difficulty, uh, uh, including hospitalization. And, uh, and uh, so Richard and Diana uh, very graciously uh, stepped in and, and offered to share with us tonight. Um, I did not plan to do this, uh, but I will. One of the reasons why we are pulling this grouping together is because uh, I think it was Diana who in the first uh, session indicated that the mental health, uh, the mental health uh, arena is also an arena for profit. And uh, so uh, there can be challenges in terms of the training there uh, in many instances, the training will orient uh, uh, providers to blame uh, the client for their difficulties in one way or another, very subtle, very subtle. And uh, so, um, so the effort to become a helper, a mental health, uh, a helper in the realm of mental health benefits from the collective project. Um, there are, there are. Um, I know in a prior situation, I became familiar with social workers who are up in arms with uh, the social work uh, um, profession. Uh, challenging a number of different uh, mandates uh, in which they're required to engage. Um, at the same time, though, there are many mental health uh, practitioners uh, who are um, who have come to become uh, serious critics, uh, as Richard indicated earlier, they share, they're not communists, uh, uh, but they share that this society in which we live is fundamentally anti-human. Um, uh, uh, going back to uh, Moussin's question, uh, even if you're not uh, also putting time into the movement, just the time that you are required to work in order to put keep a roof over your family's head and put food on the table actually forces you to neglect your children. So when we hear Richard's child in the background, <laughs> we have to, you know. Uh, so anyway, the, uh, 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 the uh, what's his name? Matt Mate, Mate, um, Gaber, Gaber Mate talks about how, uh, you know, so many of the best uh, mental health practitioners are, many of them are not communists, but they're, they are big critics of the society uh, in which we live. And um, to Anthony, I would say it's easier said than done. Uh, so how do we get beyond the easier said than done? Um, we, everybody knows we should exercise, but what portion of us know it, but we don't, uh, everybody knows that a part one, another aspect of this society is the poison food that they, uh, offer most readily. Uh, but how many of us know that the food is not especially the fast food is not healthy and we are in a crunch, uh, especially or whatever, taste uh, preferences, whatever, we do it anyway. 
So uh, again, I think it speaks to the collective project of not uh, guilt tripping each other or whatever, but actually finding those ways that will help us to the behaviors that will enable us to have longevity in the movement because that's what's needed and be able to be there wherever we are uh, when we're there, you know, to be present, you know, when we're there. So um, hopefully as we move forward, we'll be able to uh, provide more resources, more, um, more options. And I choose, I'm choosing options instead of answers. Uh, uh, more options that we can consider. And one of the things we want to look at uh, going forward is the role of the ego. Um, all of us have seen when the ego uh, uh, does its dance, uh, it can be very destructive to the collective uh, process. And so how can we um, help ourselves to understand the ego and understand that we don't have to, uh, uh, if our feelings are hurt in a situation or we, we become angry in a situation, uh, we can pause and we can know that that's uh, going on, but we can also ask ourselves if I put my feelings to the side, not deny them, but put them to the side and I look for other behaviors that are possible in a given moment based on what's needed in that moment. Do more uh, options become available? So trying to decipher uh, subjectivity uh, versus uh, objectivity. So all of these things we want to look at uh, in the future because our goal is to provide us with tools uh, that will help us uh, in the collective work project. And as I understand it, the most current science says that multitasking is unhealthy, that when you multitask, you're actually dividing your attention between the different tasks. And so all of those tasks suffer. Uh, in the press, but maybe Diane and Richard would say more. Oh, that's exactly right. Um, and multitasking is a little bit of a myth because we are, that's not how our brains work. Um, it is stressful because it, it, it is. Um, I think it's another way for, you know, to extract more labor because if the idea is you should be able to do three, four, five, six, seven things that same time it should take you less and the truth is we can't and when we do it, it is exhausting so yeah no multitasking is not really a thing that we are designed to be able to do well efficiently for any amount of time Richard yep I hate to say it but um, multitask we are only able to do one thing at a time so if we can hop between things quickly and that's it, it's not the best for our attention span long term if you think about channel surfing things like that it's not it's not great for our ability to sit down and analyze a situation long term uh, I also wanted to touch on um, Matt's question about rural health care in this country and it is a often overlooked and really under-resourced area. I'm sorry to say that I'm not aware of really any movements taking place right now that are working to address that outside of um, the expansion of, um, or, or the extension of the laws that were put in place um, that allowed Zoom to Zoom and other virtual practices to take place during the pandemic. Um, there are a couple of federally funded grants that are aimed at attracting healthcare providers 
into rural settings, but that would still most likely be located at a county hospital. And unfortunately, there are we, there there are a lot of systemic things that are this country is just continuing to fail, um, especially our our people out in rural communities. I want to go back to Kazu's question uh, about uh, how do you find a therapist. Um, sometimes it's helpful when you can identify what it is you're struggling with. If you're struggling with uh, uh, depression, um, I've heard uh, it said that then that means you're too focused on the past. Um, but that may be too simple, too too uh, too simplified. Uh, but uh, if you're struggling with anxiety, um, I've heard it said that means you're focusing too much on the future. And so mindfulness is an approach which helps with both of those challenges because mindfulness challenges us to train our attention and it and train is the emphasized word to train our attention to be in the present um and so if you really want a to explore uh the experience with a counselor or a therapist then you might look for someone who's uh, into mindfulness, but even those practitioners can be capitalist oriented. But remember, we appreciate science. So even practitioners who can who are capitalist oriented. Uh, can offer aspects of science, as Marx did in his process of study, that we extract, that we extract. Now, a person in need is not necessarily engaged in that process, but the truth remains that if you can identify what it is you're struggling with, then you might be able to find someone who can help you in that particular area. And they might not be able to help you beyond that particular area, but they might be able to help you in that particular area. Uh, if you're depressed, if you are anxious, if you have panic attacks, if you are, um, if, you, if you are too egocentric, too egocentric, um, always mad, always mad, you know, um, then you might be. Another uh, thing is this is called ACT. Uh, help me. What is it? Uh, acceptance commitment therapy. OK, so they uh, I think it's within that uh, therapeutic realm. And I try it when I'm watching the news. Uh, the arg the, it, it's argued that uh, to uh, reduce judgment and reduce attachment. So I, when, when the most heinous thing is being reported on the news and I can feel myself getting caught up uh, emotion, you know, and, and, and the sensationalism of our uh, corporate media, media is disgraceful, uh, but you can feel yourself getting ca caught up. And so I, I tell myself, no judgment, no attachment. And I used to resist because I thought it meant that I wouldn't be able to take action, but that's not true. It just means your suffering is not increased. Your suffering is not increased. So you're able to manage your emotional responses and you're still able to engage in action. So, um, um uh, as we move forward we want you everyone to become more comfortable with sharing not your personal uh business not no not that 
but the challenges, especially that you see in the movement. Um, for example, egoism, you see it all over the place. And so a big question for us is how do we, how do we navigate the ego uh, to reduce the, um, the uh, negative impact on our effort to work together, to work collectively when those egos uh, and ego battles, a lot of the stuff we uh, see uh, in many instances, that's what it is. It's ego battles uh, in, um, sometimes. And so how do we um, develop the tools, acquire the skills to help us not fall into those traps? So let's orient, uh, uh, let's pivot toward uh, closing. Um, do you have any uh, summary remarks you'd like to make, Diana? And then we'll go to Richard and then we'll call it a night. Unless, let me see if there are any more. If you have any more comments or questions, please uh, click the raised hand icon. Okay, Car okay, here we got a few. Kazoo, Carol. Okay, oh, it's Carol. Thank you, Dee. Um, thank you so much for this valuable uh, webinar. Um, I just have a comment. This is something that I noticed happening right before I retired in the last few years. It's like a new ruse of the uh, bosses. When people were complaining about too much work, the workload is too much they started this thing of work smarter not harder and uh, you know and then the workers would really get frustrated because then you start questioning yourself am i not smart enough to manage all this what am i doing wrong but it was really just code language you know for work harder i was wondering if um i just thought of that now during the webinar but um if you could comment on that is that a new thing now with younger workers a new uh, you know yeah, that's it. Okay, uh, Antonio. Yeah, D, if you don't mind, if we have time, could you repeat what you were saying about the difference of approaches between the mental health workers and the social workers? Mm, not at this time. Uh, thank you, Antonio, but I'll I'll decline at this time. Uh, uh, except to say uh, some of them are, are oriented toward uh, the capitalist uh, profit motive. And so you have to be careful. Um, so let me see if there are any other hands. All right. So toward uh, summary and closing, Diana. I just want to thank everybody for being here. Um, I hope you got something out of it. Um, my, 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 my hope is that my big takeaway for everybody is that be kinder to yourself. You do not need to be yelling at yourself to be working more, harder, you know, everybody already does more than they can, I imagine. So that is my big takeaway for everybody. Compassion, self-compassion. Uh, another thing, the science indicates that the the who we're mad at most is ourselves, and capitalism produces that. And when you're mad at yourself, then your relationship. This is going to sound weird, but the relationship with yourself is suffering, and that means you're, yeah, that's yeah. So, self compassion is very important and repairing that relationship with yourself is very important richard yeah i'd, I'd like to to echo the thanks to you d thanks diana thanks everybody for participating um compassion is, is an incredibly powerful thing i i, I do want to just um no, no I'll, I'll avoid the social worker thing but uh, yeah, mental mental health in general. It it's just like medicine. It's becoming proletarianized over time. More and more people are who are practitioners are coming to understand their relation to that production. Um, so, you know, hope, hopefully in the future, more so 
most more social workers, more counselors, more psychologists will be participating here. So I want to thank uh, Diana and Richard. Again, they stepped forward uh, like uh, Bolsheviks, uh, so to speak, if we know what that is. Some of us do, some of us don't. Anyway, whatever. Uh, and so, and we uh, we hope you all will join us uh, uh, May 20th for the next uh, workshop, uh, Mental Health for Activists. But also, if you're into uh, poetry at all, or as a writer, or or as a person experiencing art and well, working class art and culture, you're invited to join us Saturday, April 20th at 11 a.m for poetry skill building and uh, uh, to hear writers reading their work. So again, thank you everyone. Uh, I find this to be quite helpful. I am, you know, uh, growing as we move through session after session. So thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to your uh, participation as we go forward. Thank you, Diana. Thank you, Richard. Good night, everyone. <laughs>